Thank you all, thank you to the IGJLCD committee for inviting me. It's a great honor. It's always a great honor to be with speeches. I've probably been involved with speeches for longer than any of you because I don't remember, but my father used to tell me about my first assessment at the age of three. So I go back a long, long time. So it is a real delight to have been invited. I have rewritten this talk several times because it keeps on getting longer and then I try and reduce it a little bit more. And a lot of you will be bored stiff because you'll have heard a lot of it before. But hopefully this gives me the opportunity to think back over 30 odd years of working in the field and maybe looking ahead and teasing out where we could be going next. So please bear with me as I tell tales and really take you through my story but also the story of all the people I've worked with over the last 30 odd years. So who am I? I'm a crazy person. I very seldom know who I am because I wear so many hats. Um, when I went to university, there was only one thing people thought I could do, and that was to enter this new field called computer science. Having never even seen a computer, but having seen Star Wars, I knew I wanted to build a robot called RTD2 who could carry coffee upstairs. And that has always resonated with me because from a degree in computer science, I eventually went and did biomedical engineering and found the world of assistive technology. And most of you will understand what this is about, but as a technologist, I am looking at a whole range of areas where technology can be applied to support disabled people with the crucial aim of increasing independence. What would I do without my mobility scooter? I nearly cried on Monday when I realised that the key had broken off and I was having nightmares about being pushed into this arena tonight. Those things give us independence and the ability to participate on our own terms. And yet all of this is nothing without communication. And I'm so 
vehement in saying that what is the purpose of giving someone mobility unless they can talk about where they've been and what they've done. And so for me, communication is not an additional component of assistive technology. It has to underpin everything. Without communication, we just cannot do anything because, as you all know, communication is the essence of life. But for the people we work with who do not have functional speech, or understanding of language, communication is even more important. And I think if you keep this in your heads, because I'm going to come back to it at the very end, because I think we still haven't got this through to the wider um, work environments and society in which we live. So, I'm here, loads of speeches. These are, I hope you don't mind me calling you speeches. I regard myself as an honorary speechy. I have for years, and now I can officially say <laughs> I am an honorary speechy. AAC is not technology. Technology is only a tool. When I used to run five-day blitz symbolics workshops back in the 80s, my participants used to be very angry because they would realize when they looked at the agenda that there was half an hour in a five-day workshop on technology. Because unless we get that underpinning understanding of communication, technology is useless. But I am here tonight to talk about tech. So please understand that I do this with the proviso that tech is only a tool. So what do we have? People don't think about this, but voice recorders, step by step, are tech. Even a simple board is tech. Paper is technology, and we can't beat technology in that format. Visual scene displays, we've seen a complete shift in how we provide communication. Do you know that visual displays started in Dundee with Norman Alm in the 90s. We now see that all over the place. Dynamic screens, I remember Norman Alm doing the original hyperlink database with different pictures 
he gave two words and phrases. That is now how we do AAC. And one of the big bugbears I have is that that was in the late 80s, 90s, and we still use the same paradigm we had then. And I want to suggest that we need to be moving forward. Semantic compaction is still the quickest way for a lot of our users to communicate, actually linking codes to words and phrases. But I would not like to have to go through that learning process to actually gain the skill level that expert users need to be able to achieve probably the fastest communication we have today. And then, of course, when I got to Dundee, most of the work was on literacy. And I remember having arguments with my colleagues, trying to convince them that the majority of our AAC user populations were not literate. Over the years, my I've started to think, why aren't they more literate? And I know that in the field, we are now way, way more aware that we should be actually introducing literacy to a lot more people than we ever did. So there's an issue about expectation, about what people can achieve in the long run. Fantastic. Technology gives people a voice. We know that by giving people a voice, the motivation to communicate, to express, starts working. The motivation is there. And yet, despite all this tech, the reviews say that most AAC users, most people with little or no functional speech rely on their low tech. And the abandonment of the high tech is still very, very high. Now, this paper, quoting from the journal, um, it's now quite a few years old, 2012, but I still think those challenges are still there. The reason why we have such a high abandonment rate and such a reliance on low tech those factors still exist. When I look at the low tech, of course, there is one AAC system that, so, um, that I'm not getting in myself. Um, 
that, that beats everything and that's the, the human interface. I have yet to come across a better AAC system than a human partner who knows that person inside out. But we have all these factors and I'm not going to go through them all. What I want to say is that Simon Judge and colleagues in their paper identified ease of use and communication rate as two of the top reasons for abandonment and low use. And I get very excited because that tells me it's all about how we are not designing systems fit for purpose. And coming back to my comment about the fact that in 30 years we have not changed the fundamental paradigm We need to actually grapple with the fact that we are locked into the same process. Devices might have got smaller, they might have got more chic, and they might have got more colourful and the voices might sound better, but the underlying way we access language has not changed design. In my work, way, way back during my PhD, I was very aware that people I talked to were very passive. They seldom initiate and they wait to be asked closed questions. And in many ways that is still the case for many, many of our users. The bottom comment, they rely on others for transition. So when somebody moves the environment or goes from a classroom to home, or goes from school to further education, they do not carry their stories with them. Other people carry their stories for them. So in my paper, which was not in your journal, but in another, I think, quite prestigious journal, I looked at the access to communication and to narrative. And I said, well, basically, we have a speed issue, which goes back to Simon's paper talking about rate. How can you communicate at two words a minute? You can't. Preliteracy skills, we're coming back to the fact that we don't actually put enough effort into teaching literacy. Or when we do, 
we don't have the knowledge or the expertise to actually give people access to literacy the way they need to access literacy. Uh, going back here quickly, one of the projects we did some time ago was to give children access to phonics without the need to learn labels. So could they just play with sound and make up words without knowing how to read and write? We had children coming up with swear words. And that is a motivation if I ever saw one. I've never seen a parent in such a quandary. <laughs> shh, shh. And you could just see her. This was the first word her son had ever generated by himself. Whose vocabulary is it when we pre-storm vocab? Is it the child's? How do we know what children want to talk about? Or even adults? My work with aphasia it was very difficult for even for spouses to guess what their spouse with the face he wanted to say, even though they were that close. So whose vocabulary is it? Think about training someone to use these horrific systems because all the operational skill is laying at their door. They have to master the operational skill to work these devices. You try and learn how to use a PC at the age of 90 and you might realize the difficulties. Joan Murphy and her work in the 80s, 90s, reminded us that actually on every simple board and every communication device we have, I want to drink. Who on earth wants to learn to say that? And finally, we know from the psycholinguistic um, literature that narrative it breaks up the bulk of conversation. And yet, have you ever heard an AAC user spontaneously tell a story? Very, very seldom. And when they do, they normally turn to their caregiver or their friend and they give them a cue and the friend tells the story with them. Who are the story guardians? Um, colleagues of mine, their grown-up son with a learning disability went into a new care home with his favourite painting 
and the carers decided that the painting was not appropriate. No one had actually told them that this painting had been in his grandmother's house for as long as he could remember. And that painting had been left to him in his grandmother's will. But that story just didn't go with him. So who are the story guardians? And how do we start designing devices to support all these requirements? So that's the bad news. The good news, and this is what I get really excited about, is that we do have the potential to begin to design more intelligent systems which will actually support language rather than have the user do all the work. Stephen Hawking, my worst and best example. You could give Stephen the worst design <laughs> system ever and he would make it work for himself because he has the knowledge, the understanding and the team around him to make that technology work. But there are very few people and a lot of us in the AAC no, the handful of people who can do it well, but they are the cream of the crop. And we need to be designing for everyone. So this is what we try and do at Dundee. <coughs> Anybody heard of AI? Not artificial insemination, <laughs> but artificial intelligence. <laughs> Very much in the news, um, intelligent automated cars. Big money going into this. We should be using this technology to support language and communication. So I have fun, because this is what I do for a living. And not because I can do it, but because I work with very, very brainy people who can do it. I know enough to know what I want systems to be able to do. So very briefly, I'm going to touch on all of these areas of work in which we've done. Anybody with young children we know that they love creating puns. That's part of learning language. And they are terrible, aren't they? <laughs> and so we actually created a computer that did just that. Oops! Created, don't worry, I'm I do a, a fishy exhibition here. 
we created this system with colleagues in Aberdeen and Edinburgh to create the most awful fans. And some of you will know this one. Say again. What do you call a spicy missile? Spicy okay. missile? Yes. Spicy missile. Say again. Okay. Mm -hmm. What would you call a spicy missile? Okay. Say again. Okay. No, it's difficult to get the right time. Okay. Uh, but mm -hmm. she is fantastic. Yeah. First line. Last line. A hot shot. A hot shot. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Okay. That's very funny. Say it again. Say it again. Uh -huh. What? Now there are loads of things that don't work there, but you've got to remember that that was the first time this little girl had ever seen the interface. And what I was interested with was how she controlled the interaction. And intuitively she had the pragmatics to actually ask the question and then wait for the answer. And she was leading that conversation. We did a study which is, was published in the ACM Transactions of Accessible Communication. And we did it with nine children. And what we found was that they understood that no one else had seen these jokes. So they wanted to share them. And we had a generalization in that they were only using their existing AAC more interactively because they really started to understand the power of controlling conversation, which we all know. But it was that interaction which surprised us. Now many of you will know that my work in narrative is very dear to me. And in fact, my PhD was actually published in 94, I think, in this Journal. So before the L came into it, it was the journal, International Journal of Communication Disorders. So Gavin, look it up. How do we support storytelling? And basically we developed a system whereby we generated story automatically. And this was done by collecting information about location, people, and objects. And we used a very innovative technology called data to text. And eat your heart out, speeches, <laughs> because we can actually generate language from data. Now, can you imagine what more we could do if we had more interaction between linguists, speeches, teachers, competing people to get the language we wanted to 
to empower children to get the understanding of scaffolding so that then we can move on to get them to generate their own language. There's an um, interface going back to the paradigm issue. It's time we started playing with new ways of interfacing. So here we generated five events. Each event consisted of several messages. And the crucial thing with stories is we give the user the ability to evaluate those stories. So to put their emotion into that story. Speech acts. Yeah? You want those same speech acts? Well, computing has built on that idea to give you the speech act, to give the person the concept of what they're doing, rather than making them get the operational stuff correct. Can we get them to experience language in a way. So once again, just quickly, because as usual, I'm running out of time. Then I went to do your primary instead of eating. Sorry, I'm going to start this again. It should go automatically. Yeah. Then I went to your primary instead of eating. She is nice. She's nice. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, the idea of the speech act, she's going in for the happy face because she knows she wants that speech act rather than trying to formulate the individual language. So what are you trying to get the operation of the words? of the pragmatics, what comes first? I don't know, I'm not a speechy. <laughs> the other thing to say here is that she made a mistake and did a visitor was there twice. Did it affect the conversation? No because our minds just build on it. This is very quick, guys. I just want to run through quickly, quickly, the issue around rate. Rate is really difficult. But if you think that good typists only type at 27 minutes words per minute, why are we trying to speed up word output? 
if we can never actually achieve these speaking rights. Anybody know how quickly we talk? Yeah. The other time I asked a bunch of speeches, no one knew. <laughs> so there are various issues around prediction as well. We find that people don't actually use prediction, even though it could speed them up. So this is one of the areas I'm working on at the moment is can we understand why people don't pick up uh, prediction? And I think it's very demor demoralizing when we try and achieve 140 words a minute. There's no way that any of us could type at that rate which leads us to the point that we think the only way of achieving those rates is by using utterance-based systems. And this looks awful, but this is John Todman and Norman Arm's work in the 90s, where they were creating systems that were pragmatically based, and they were achieving up to 64 words a minute. And the lady who took part in this project still hankers back to that system and which she had a similar system. But the problem is it's handcrafted, intensive training, and people don't always pick up predictions. So where do we go from there? Well, Maybe we have to look at context aware. And this is my final project I'll show you. It's our current project, SRP. The guy in Cambridge is the inventor of the swipe keyboard on your mobile phones. So we've got them on board and top people in computer vision. So can we actually improve the rate by leveraging contextual information? Location, time, people, sound, how do we do that? How do we create that really complex database automatically? And the way we do it, or trying to do it. <laughs> How? You can see this. This um, is a body-worn camera, and Rod is in the car taking the video of the whole you. thing. Holiday. How was my holiday? How was your holiday? Actually, we were very lucky. We had fabulous weather for uh, the whole week. Uh. So basically. We know that every time he's in the car with his helper, he asks the same thing. So, because we're all boring. We're boring people. There's nothing new about what we say. 
say, can we leave for each all that? And then finally, I wanted to make a comment about the fact that all this design can only take place if we base it in reality and have disabled people on the research team and working with us. Our groups are now actually educating <coughs> all our medical students. They run the awareness training for every second year student. We have now trained over a thousand students over five years. It, it just it amazes me how much they have to offer. So, apologize for my ramblings, but where do we go? How do we harness all this potential when we still have children languishing without communication. We have adults who are four years post-stroke having said nothing for four years. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not technology, it's not speech, it's everything together and there have been so many reports about um, Communication Matters, the Right to Speak Project. They're all trying to tackle this training at all levels, and yet we're still finding people without. I also want to suggest that we do have a problem because healthcare is giving us more clients, which is great. Super. They are keeping all these people alive, prolonging their lives or keeping babies going, which is great. But my experience is once they get into society, speech therapists cannot do the whole job. It's impossible. And what they end up having is basic care and maybe some mobility. If and is that participation, is that quality of life? And I'm sorry to say, but this is the reality for so many of the people we work with. Yes, a few people with good support, with parents, with family, with ongoing care, do access education, environmental control, recreation. But as soon as you cannot talk for yourself, stand up for yourself or have somebody do that for you, you've had it. You like the women four year post-stroke that I met who hadn't talked for four years and there was nothing wrong with her language. She wasn't even amazing and I sat and went through A, B, C, D, E and I got her to give me words. Four years, nothing. 
Can I present a solution? We actually have to, and this is something I'm working on at the moment, <coughs> with Rowan Slaughter and a number of other people. It is a time to create a new type of professional who's actually got all these skins, who will be the connection and the glue to actually make technology work with the person, with their environment on a day-to-day situation. And I think I've talked for long enough. <coughs> so I've actually got one, one advert at the bottom. There we were a couple of us looking for participants, people. <laughs> so on behalf of Janice, <laughs> Well, I got to my arm twisted by one of your colleagues. <laughs> um, I ask, I don't know how you've been pronouncing it, so Janice and her project are looking for AAC people and we are looking for literate AAC users. And on that note, I would say thank you for listening. I've gone over time as usual, <laughs> but I really appreciate it and I hope there's a bit of time for questions. Okay, well, um, thank you, Anna Lou, for a um, exactly what we were expecting from you and so much more that was there, there were just so many issues that you've raised there representing the breadth of your research the breadth of your intellectual curiosity and your passions as well so a huge thank you from everyone before we have a, a final round of applause uh, we do have time for questions i know um, a glass of wine would also be um, advantageous to many of us um, so um, has anyone got any uh, questions they'd like to ask or comments they'd like to raise on the back of anna Lou's talk Janice. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you very much for that inspiring and thought-provoking and challenging presentation. I, as you were talking, I was writing down a couple of things that seem to recur, and I, I just hope you have the answer to this. <laughs> what, what seemed to be coming through repeatedly was our expectations and our aspirations for the people that we may be supporting and working with and that that has a huge influence in terms of what we might place in front of them in terms of communication opportunities. How can we do that better, is my question. I don't know, but, but, but I think I've realised in designing systems it is very difficult for people to be challenged without context. So when we design, I'm trying to educate the end user, be it the professional, the parent, the AAC user, to think out of the box. So we think we know what computers can do. So that limits our horizons of what we could possibly achieve. So instead of looking at the goal or the what the next goal is, we're actually thinking what the boundaries are. And I think it's the same here. 
it's like um, the, the dream workshops that a lot of us know about. It's actually looking at the individual person and saying, what do you want to achieve? And not saying that it is impossible, but breaking it down. And I think so often, even in my life, my parents were lambasted for daring to take me out of primary school to go to an academic high school because they weren't accepting that the daughter was disabled. Because the professionals had already made assumptions as to what the boundaries would be. And I think it's similar here and with design. We think we know what the boundaries are and it's very difficult to think beyond those. Thank you. Hi, Ali. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I'm really, really interested in the, uh, the ACLP project and what you're doing with that. And I think it's, it's such a fantastic, well-needed idea. Um, I have often thought about whether you could build some level of um, kind of intonation or voice prediction into some AAC systems and wonder whether that's something that you're looking at as part of the project or something that you might look at in the future. It's an offshoot because we can't do everything, <laughs> but we now have enough capability to actually take voice in, sort of record voice and maybe detect that in, in help, <laughs> intonation, you know. <laughs> I'm sure I'm getting age-related of anomia. <laughs> uh, that intonation might give us additional input. But what we're also looking at is, can we actually maybe recognize keywords? And in the 90s, one of my honor students did a Wizard of Oz experiment with word prediction where the system could listen to the speaking partner and it actually took the key words and that actually improved the prediction tenfold. So we've just scraped the surface. Even if we have profiles about who the person's sort of circle of friends are, what are they interested in? When I did my PhD, my supervisor, Alan Ewell, wanted to send the idea to the House of Parliament, the Commons, because of course we were predicting what story would come next um, from past experience. And I'm sure I did it because my father was a storyteller. So we knew before he started the story what story he was going to tell. <coughs> but of course, because we are tweaking it because of who we are talking to. So if I'm talking to Janice, 
I would tweak my story differently to talking to Kathleen because you have different backgrounds to me. So you know different things about me. All that we could build in to the prediction. Thank you. Okay, I think we have, um, we have time for one more question before we, we can always carry on talking informally. Uh, oh, Julia. We can manage two. Paul? I was, uh, there's um, some work within aphasia around um, virtual environments and <coughs> Eva Park from City University, so where, which kind of lends itself to things being you know, humorous and odd and a bit more interesting and quirky to comment on. Is that something that you're aware of any... Um, work with children with physical disabilities, um, you know, emerging in? There's quite a lot coming out of the AR and the, well, augmented reality and the um, other reality, virtual realities. Um, we've actually got one of my PhD students working with iPads, and taking photographs and getting the vision to identify what's happening in the scene. So I think there are two ways of doing it. AR and VR are there, I would think, more as a therapeutic system. So I think we need to think about what is a therapeutic system and also what's a real-time support system. So we can now take a photograph with our phone and detect that there are a pair of glasses lying here. And for someone with anomia, is that something we should be looking at in parallel to the virtual reality or augmented reality where it might be a bit more therapeutic? Thanks, Anna Lou. That was um, it was actually not demoralising. It was really quite inspiring. Um, but you'll forgive me if I ask a slightly um, uh, left field question. Do you think there's any risk that, um, as our understanding and use of technology becomes more powerful, becomes more efficient, we become perhaps quite dazzled by it? that we um, forget the need to um, develop children's um, underlying representation of language, their conceptual knowledge, and, and the input side. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> I did not plot that. <laughs> I think we're already doing that. I don't think it's a risk. I think that's what has been happening for the past 20 years. I think especially in English-speaking countries, we have actually been dazzled by the systems they talk, and we expect because we can give somebody a system that talks, they can talk. And I think it then links into Janice's comment that actually our expectations are fixed because we're actually restricting the ability, especially for children, to develop language because they are being constrained 
binary systems we are giving them. And I will probably be shot dead because of this. Not from here. <laughs> but I think being, being trained, my basic training in the AAC was through bliss symbolics, was through giving children an inner language. And when I talk to some of the people I know who use AAC today, I can tell you, and I'm not trained, who has got an inner language because they've been given that. Why do deaf children, why do they have their own language, expressive language, and we don't give our children an expressive language. Can I be very controversial? I've been known to say that what we are doing is training little monkeys to retrieve pre-stored stuff but we're not giving them the ability to generate language. Another bit of controversy, seeing as I'm sitting here, this needs to be part of teachers' responsibility. Teachers and speech and language therapists need to take equal responsibility in developing children's language. And I don't care whether they are being diagnosed as profoundly multiply learning disabled or not. We never know what the potential of these children is until we give them the tools and this is all the language to demonstrate where they are progressing. <laughs>